feel like saying we are live we're not live we're recording now Andy Williams welcome mate welcome to the studio fucking great to uh, great to reconnect we were saying on the icebreaker well you depressed me by saying what 15 years since we last so yeah spoke 15 years yeah it would have been oh my 15 god 15 years and it's gone like we were saying in the blink of an eye You're crazy um, um Glad you're here, though, mate. Glad you're here, and uh, we're going to get on to the book and uh, and all of that because you know some of the stuff you mentioned in Icebreaker. It sounds like you have had you had not had you had a, a relatively unusual outside the reg career. Yeah, life. And it sounds like it was unusual beforehand, but um, no, it's good. It's good to have you here, mate. Thanks, so welcome. Me. Yeah, sweet. Um, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? All oh, right, yeah. So, oh, so you do listen to the podcast? Yes. I'm glad to hear that. I don't. I'm under no illusion that pe- everyone who comes in is, in this and sits here listens to the podcast. Most people don't. But it's nice to hear that they do. Yeah. What's your favourite episode? Ooh. Do you listen since the start? Since the Jared well, days? Yeah, since the Jared days. Um, yeah, like I say, I've not listened to everyone, but um, how dare oh, you? I know that's a brilliant <laughs> one. Um, yeah, Shay that you had on. Um, what a fucking dude! Yeah, so what I know, a dude. Well, know, he's from your way. Yeah, I know Shay. Well, oh dear. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've met on um, we've met a couple of times. Was that when in the first job you did when you left the register to come on to later on a little bit? Uh, no, okay. no, no. Um, yeah, he he kindly. Um, so I'm, I'm a firefighter uh, now, and we have a uh, veterans uh, group within the, the fire service. And he kindly come and did a talk. Um, and yeah, we've, we've got some mutual friends. Um, but yeah, that was a great episode. He is a no bullshit uh, man, Shay Doyle. Yeah, My God, what a what, dude! Yeah, what a guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, top guy. And so have you met Christy? No, I've not. Uh, Christy was Reg, you know that? Yes, yeah. so I believe, yeah. Um, but he was Reg and he was the youngest guy in the Falklands to deploy the Falklands. Yeah, I have, I've listened to the episode. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, again, you can uh, you can tell straight away where they're from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, and most recently was Liz. Um, Liz McConaughey. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great That was a good episode. episode. Have you read the book? No, uh, I've ordered the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've not read the book yet. Get a chance to RV with her, do so. She's a mega lass, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, incredible story from you know from listening to the podcast. Well, she's smashing the speaker circuit at the minute. So Mandy Mandy Hickson's taken under her wing. Mandy Hickson is the uh, ton- female tornado pilot. I think she was the first female tornado pilot, fighter pilot. Oh, okay. that fight the bomber. Well, oh yeah, people are like it's not a fighter. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what Liz does now. She she delivers talks to all sorts of organisations and stuff. Makes a living like that. Mega yeah, banging it out. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah, no, not one for public speaking or just I am I enjoy it I've thought about doing that kind of stuff in the past and I have done a couple of paid gigs yeah. I pile too much pressure on myself I pile too much pressure on myself and it's in fact you were talking about the icebreaker case like uh, expecting too much of yourself and pressuring yourself and I think uh, and overthinking yes like, am I is what I'm saying going to resonate are they going to find it interesting who the fuck am I to be stood here delivering like a motivational talk or an interest talk? And in reality, <clears throat> you alluded to it on the icebreaker. I, th- I think, God, got to be 90 plus percent of people have got something unusual and fascinating. If, if you had the ability to, like, in the blink of an eye, scroll through everybody's life experiences on the planet now, you'd be able to find an interesting thing in each of them go fucking hell that's crazy well yeah. that's unusual that's interesting learn something more we can't do that though. you know everyone has a story everyone has a story yeah. I think. everyone's story is unique to them and um, I'm, I'm exactly the same um, it drives my missus insane because I <clears throat> overthink and I put so much pressure on myself on in loads of different settings um you know promotions in the gym it's uh, it's either one extreme or, or the other and then like you said that um, imposter syndrome I suppose that voice in your head of self-worth it gnaws at you it sometimes it can be quite loud and then you have to kind of say uh, no you know like I said all, all, everybody's story is unique everyone has their own perspective on things nobody can tell me my story um, 
so you just have to, yeah, just constantly have to battle with yourself to think no it's a, you're doing a positive thing it's about framing how you look at yourself like um, as well uh, and not making the mistake I think of trying to compare yourself to others and trying to recognise just how unusual or difficult things have been in your life that you've gone through I've got a really good friend um, you would know him I'm not going to say his name on the podcast you would know him from he's South Wales and uh, he said on a couple of occasions to me in, in private conversation I wish I was like you and I look at him and think and I say I think you do, you do the wrong thing you're comparing you were assuming you know what my life is like and my experience of it yeah you know and it, and to him it must look amazing I don't know why it does because it isn't amazing I don't think it looks amazing to anyone but to him when he compares it to his he just sees it as easier I think and like a bit of luck which is fucking incorrect incorrect in some ways incorrect in others but I look at him and I think my god he has been through he has it so difficult because of his mental state like the way his brain works you know again like similar things like you were saying there overthinking stuff but also anxiety depression you know chronic things that he has to deal with every day and he's been doing that for years and he's still here and I look at him and think I don't think if I had that battle every day I don't think I'd be here I look Mm. at him him and think he has resilience that I probably don't have I couldn't cope with that for all those years and he he has his down times but he's still here and he's still breathing he's got a job he's got a missus and he you know he he seems to be enjoying life more than not enjoying it you know and yeah I think if he looked at himself in a different way he would be much happier and he wouldn't be comparing himself to other people and thinking I wish I was like this x y or z person or if I had this x y or z thing you know it's all about relative who you are now and what and who you were before yeah you know because he's definitely better now than he was before and he seems to be having a good life it's yeah. difficult difficult I think I think in today's today's um day and age we you were talking about media beforehand we're much more driven to make these comparisons and strive to be something that we're not and it almost always involves cost <laughs> paying for something <laughs> or you know it's in order to try and achieve those things it's like fo- it's like false you know like false, set the false false objectives for yourself to be better false eyelashes yeah. Go and get a tan. Buy these clothes. Have this fashionable stuff. Go on holiday three times a year, even though you can't afford it. Or once a year, even though you can't afford it. You know, have the the flash car. Uh, have the flash phone. You know, just um, well, it's yeah. not good. First of all, you know, he's this person is lucky that they've got you as a as a mate. Um, to, to, you know, to think of them like that. But you know, you're absolutely right. I would hate to be a teenager now compared to. You know, when I grew up in the late eighties, early nineties, um, just the the pressure from social media, the access to information all the time, twenty four seven. There's so many, so there's so many more pressures on young people now. Um, there's no wonder that there's a rise in um, you know social anxiety and these sort of you know these sort of conditions um but no you're absolutely right and it is a lot of the time it is the the narrative that in your your mind that you tell yourself um because i i feel like i can look at one situation um and then the 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 negative voices in your head can take over you know you're you're not good enough um who are you to do this um what is everybody going to think but then you just you can just change the narrative in your in your mind and think of it from a different perspective, and then all of a sudden you're like, no, actually, if I just reframe how I look at this problem, um, I do have experience and I do add value to this, whatever the issue is. Um, I think that's important for people to know that that you can reframe how you look at an issue. Uh, or challenge or whatever it may be yeah you can you know you you'll go through life and there's always going to be problems and nothing's always going to go the right way and i think you can have people who who have the unfortunate mindset for whatever reason where <clears throat> they think things always always go wrong for them and they think it doesn't go wrong for other people again my friend here we were talking about he's one of those and something will go wrong for him 
and you think, oh God, I always get the bad luck. And reality, the reframing is, and I've explained this to him, and it's something I've had to teach myself as well, is that no, things will go wrong. No one has the perfect life. Things, th- things will go wrong. And you have to accept that that's going to happen. It isn't bad luck. It isn't that you are the bad luck person of the world or your friend group or your, or your, or your work group or whatever. It's just you are living the same life as everyone else. You just experience it. You're experiencing those things going wrong in a different way. It's ebbs and flows, right? Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, positive, negative. And if you look at it like, okay, things are going to go wrong. I need to accept. I need to be accepting of things that go pear shit. The boiler breaks down when I've just forked out for, I don't know, fixing my car. Like I'm on my, like for example, me. I'm on my third mechanical breakdown in about two months. It is an absolute nightmare in there. I've got no vehicles whatsoever. I've got a car and I've got a bike. They're both off the road. It is a fucking nightmare. Everything is happening at the wrong time. It's real hard for me at the minute to accept that I am not just getting all the bad luck. I think I am, but also it's like no things just go pear shaped all at the worst times sometimes, you know. And you, you think of it like that, and it sort of mentally prepares you for those things to go wrong. But I. We do, we do find it much easier to recognise things going wrong than things going right, don't we? Yeah. When things are going right, we just sort of enjoy it. And that was a happy time. But we don't think, I had great luck there. <laughs> <laughs> I am I had so great luck. lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, do we? We don't. It's really strange. It's really strange. Yeah. How would yeah. you? So have you always suffered with um, that uh, overthinking? Or is it something that came on later in life? Overthinking later on in life... Um, and it sounds like you were describing imposter syndrome as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Overthinking um, later on in life, and it is something that I th- that you have to learn to manage and control because otherwise it'll completely take control. Uh, you know, it'll it'll ruin you. But the setting high standards, you know, from joining the military, that was always. I've always been competitive. I've always wanted to to set high standards um, for myself Um, and it's a blessing and a curse like I say it drives my my missus insane because you know I might have an interview or something coming up and um, she'll say you'll be fine you always do really well well yeah well a lot of the time I do but it's not by accident it's through like sleepless Rats. nights and <laughs> just being becoming obsessive over over things and um yeah, it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, Is yeah. that a bad thing, though, Andy? If you yeah. apply in that attitude to the to things that are worthy of the effort, interview yeah. for a job, for example. Now, I'd argue, if you really want that job, then yeah, go balls out, max effort, and try and get it. Yeah, you know, is in preparation. Maybe not to the extent of sleepless nights, you know, but in preparation. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, and it, everything comes. At, um, a cost, you know, you pay you pay a cost, and it's I suppose it's just whether that cost is worth what you're applying it to, um, and if it's anything worthwhile or positive, then most of the time it is, I suppose. But it doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of us do that. If you know, from our background, um, and I think that. Those behaviours are the reason why um, people find themselves in good positions or they have good opportunities presented to them. They're not afraid to take risk. Um, they're resilient and um, have the ability to apply themselves to whatever it may be. An interview, a challenge, a sporting event. Um, yeah, so... Mm. It's not all. There are there are a lot of positives. Mm. Um, you mentioned on the icebreaker, you, you were raised by your sister. Yes. How? Why and how? Um, yeah. So how much older is she than you? Assuming she's older. Yeah, she, <laughs> yeah she's. <laughs> um, she's eleven years older than me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I. Uh, I grew up partly in North Wales, mo- mostly North Wales. Um, but my 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 mum um, abandoned me when I was two. Um, she, you know, she was a, she's an alcoholic and quite violent. Uh, so yeah, she she left us uh, when I was two. And my I've got an older brother 
he left and joined the Royal Marines at 17. Um, and my father uh, worked in Saudi Arabia. He was a project manager for a petrochemical um, site. <coughs> So he spent 22 years in Saudi, before that, Malaysia. Um, so he, he's always worked abroad my whole life. You know, I've never actually lived with him. So when my mum left, um, my sister and I went to Saudi. We lived there for about three years. Um, and my sister, when we came back, my sister was only 16. And she was at that age where she was missing her friends, missing um, the lifestyle that we have over here because over there we lived in a Western compound, you know, back then in the, the late 80s. Um, it was very restrictive, you know, it was a very restrictive place to live. But I loved it as a kid, you know, it was just a big adventure. So we moved back to North Wales when she was 16 and I was five, I think, around about five. Um, and we lived in a we had a council flat, um, and she said to my dad, "No, I will look after Andrew." Um, yeah, and she was my. He she, stayed in Saudi. He yeah, he stayed in Saudi. Um, he had a good job over there. Uh, he'd been there for so long, and then every year from from when we returned to when I joined the military at sixteen. Um, I would go back every year for six weeks of the summer holidays, six to eight weeks, uh, and spend it in Saudi. Um, so, so him and your mother were they weren't together? No, right. no. Yeah, she, um, yeah, she, she left, but she, she came back. Uh, I, I've, I do have memories of her as a, as a as a child because she lived in the area. She was sort of in and out of the area but all the memories I had of her um, weren't good ones uh, uh, drunk and violent and um, yeah so I didn't I had no relationship with her uh, and then f funnily enough before we went to Afghanistan in 2006 um, I, uh, I thought I'm gonna find her. I'm gonna find her because I'm a I'm a grown man now, even though I was twenty twenty one at the time. Um, I'm gonna find her, and I'm gonna make my own decision. You know, I'm gonna make my own view on it as a as an adult. And I didn't have a clue where she was. I didn't know if she was dead or alive. So I checked the death register. I checked people that I knew that she knew from villages in North Wales. Um, and I f she was in a, a hostel in Worcester, of all places. Uh, so I went to see her before. We what, went. what what kind of hostel? Like a women's? It was like a, um, a halfway okay. home type place. Um, so I went to see her. Uh, and did she know you were coming? Well, I call. I got a number from for her from an ex husband, um, and I called her up and I said. <sighs> Right, <laughs> and yeah, it's Andrew, and um, she said, "Who's Andrew? <laughs> Your fucking son." Uh, yeah, so I went there, but there's, there was just no emotional connection there at all. And then when was we she still drinking? Yeah, yeah, still drinking. Um, uh, and then when we went to when we went to Afghan. I sent a few blueies, you know, letters and stuff. Uh, but yeah, there was just no emotional. There was no relationship. Did, did there. you want to connect with her then? You, or did you want to, What was the, what was the aim to see what she was like and whether there was if she was a decent person or not? That kind of thing. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose I wanted to see it from. Uh, I wanted to make my own mind up of of what had, what had happened, <clears throat> um, and I suppose it just really confirmed in my mind that we did what we did was the right thing. Did she explain why she left? Um, she gave she gave me her side of the story. Um, she well, she ultimately she left for she she remarried. Um, so yeah, but just not. I mean, I remember, I remember in high school walking back from school. I knew where she lived, uh, and I must have been like I say she was on and off the scene. I must have been eleven, and. Uh, 
me and my mate uh, Jay Jay Hughes do you remember Jay yeah he's in recce so you went to school with him yeah <laughs> yeah um, I said uh, yeah you know I know where she lives we'll go and see her and this was at quarter past three in the afternoon and she answered the door and um, she was blind drunk um, black eye her arm was in a cast and I was just so embarrassed uh, you know as, as you would be mm. um yeah, and like I say, she was quite, you know, she was quite violent um, at times. So I just drew a line under it. You know, I felt like I went to see. I made my own mind up. Um, and my my sister and my brother they're older than me. So my sister's like I say, she's eleven years old, and my brother's a few years more than that. So they have a different. They had a different relationship and a different um, different experiences with her than what I did because I was so young. So it was quite easy for me to just, you know, draw a line under it, and that that was that. Mm. Um, so, what was it like being raised by your sister? Um, <laughs> well, she was a she was still a child herself. Um, I mean, what she did was, you know, extraordinary. She, I know, sixteen, yeah, so yeah I'll raise him. <laughs> and later on in life. Um, she saved my life in another way um yeah so what she did was extraordinary but she was 16 um so it was um yeah she did the best she could with what we had we didn't have a lot like i say we lived in a council flat um she was there for me if i needed her but um yeah she had her own life to live and she she married and she had kids and um, but I always remember at school thinking like I couldn't understand why I didn't have a, a mum or a dad. It's embarrassing as a you know as a kid. You know you just I used to think like I wonder why you know that, I think that's where that self worth comes from. You think hmm. is it because I'm not good enough? Is there something inherently wrong with me? Why you know she doesn't want me? Um, but uh, but yeah she yeah she so she yeah she sacrificed a lot for me. It can it, it, I suppose you know it, you must have a much better understanding of why children who grow up with one or no parents and one or both and or one or both of them are abusive or or mentally uh, compromised in some way or, you know, be that alcoholism, be that drug abuse, be that some other, you know, thing. Uh, make him, you must have a better, much better understanding of why kids grow up and become unhinged off the, off the walls, real violent. I might, I've got a cousin who grew up with um, uh, alcoholic mother and, uh, you know, different partners. And, you know, he, he grew up extremely violent and it took his, and he's got some you know he has some mental health issues over the years and it's taken a lot for him to try and turn around to be I think it's taken a lot for him to turn around to be something that is you know something close to normal and make something of his life and you get other kids who are completely fucked and grow up and they're just in and out of the justice system and they're just no good to a man or beast no good to society they're just, they're just bad apples and arguably through no fault of their own you know, because of the upbringing they have or have or haven't had, you know, you must have a much better understanding of that. Because I say you haven't turned out too bad, considering <laughs> all the weight of the things that sound like we're against you. You know, yeah, and I think um, I think people, you know, my my story is not unique uh, by any means. And I think <clears throat> I mean, you just go and speak to anyone in parachute regiment and other regiments, and a lot of people come from unorthodox unorthodox backgrounds or rough estates or um, broken homes and um, a lot of the time they make good soldiers I think and um, yeah that that was for me I wanted to get out of North Wales as soon as I possibly could at 16 and um, yeah it was it was it was a an amazing opportunity and it gave me it gave me everything that I perhaps lacked growing up you know um unity family community um 
direction on how to live, how to live your life. You know, the, those those the guidance that you would that you would get from a parent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to going, oh my god, what I got? I'm getting no advice or guidance for anything. I'm getting no teaching. I'm getting no. I've got no one to look up to and be and as a role model. And the military can give you all of that. Yeah, which is all right if you get the right role models. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's all right if you get the right role yeah. models. You know, I remember there's a there was a guy um, when I had when I was a platoon sergeant for one of the platoons. And I think I can't remember how he came about. I think he got arrested over the weekend, and he had filled in his stepdad, as in beating his stepdad, stepdad up bad, randomly on the weekend. He wasn't even drunk, and came back in the Monday and it's like, right, what happened? Why have you got? Why have you done this? And basically, his, his dad, had, his stepdad, had sexually abused him as a kid you know, like fucking hell and he'd grown up as an adult now he's in the red he's like that should have happened I'm going to go in I'm going to go in fucking <laughs> show him what should have happened just fill him in and you go hmm can't really argue with your actions <laughs> okay <laughs> hopefully he get off with it and he got, he got off with it it's like you know you do all get all kinds of weird and wonderful backgrounds to join up um, yes you do and I yeah. think a lot of people that join the military don't they don't join to go and get those things we just spoke about. They join because they don't see they have any other option. They see it as an easy way to get away and or earn money and and they've probably got other people in their family or friends group that have done that. And it's a surefire way to come get a career in inverted commas, right? Yeah. Or get out of where they're living. But it, they don't realise that and it brings them these things that they didn't realise they were missing because they'd never had them. You know, I just, you know, a child never know. A child who's never had a role model, advice, a guidance, father or mother doesn't realise these things that they're missing because they've never had life experience to know it until they're given it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But so my, like I say, my older brother was in the was in the Marines at the time. Um, yeah, so uh, early nineties, and um, I suppose I looked up to him a lot um, and what he was doing, and I, that probably first give me the idea of being in the military but I mean I knew from primary school that um, I wanted to be in the, in, in the army why is that? Um, well like I say I looked up to my brother um, so how much older is he than you? he will be 14 or 15 years older okay yeah, so quite quite a bit and you know I saw it as he got out of the village he got out of North Wales and he had all these amazing experiences and travel. Um, yeah, and I, so I joined the cadets uh, as soon as I could. And then I started learning about the parachute regiment. Um, yeah, and like I said, I knew at a young age, uh, probably 12, something like that, that that was what I wanted, that was what I was set to do. Why not Marines if your brother was there? Well, initially, when I, cause when I was, when I was uh, a lot younger, go and visit, visit him um, and he would take me to the barracks he would show me the weapons in the guard room I'd meet some of the you know, some of the guys there and then as I get older I just stubbornly wanted to do my own thing I didn't want to be <laughs> compared to him yeah, yeah and obviously the French is a bit hallier uh, um, yeah and so yeah I was just and I, I, spent, I didn't spend a lot of time in school so my sister remarried um, when I was, I must have been 12, 13. Oh, so she got married quite young then, first off. Yeah, yeah very, yeah. very young the first time. And then, yeah, <clears throat> she she met somebody else and spent a lot of time at this person's house. So there was a lot of time I had the flat to myself. And uh, me and a friend of mine would bunk off school and we'd plan these... Um, elaborate fitness training exercises on the beach in North Wales <laughs> in preparation for joining the military he he ended up joining the Marines I joined the Paris um, and we found we found like half a telegraph pole and we would we'd carry it on the beach before school if we went to school um, <laughs> and uh, we used to go on these long runs to Llandidno on the coast uh, you, know, you know all in preparation rocks in a Bergen and running up the mountain and um, 
you know, and then I'd be in school and some of the, the girls at school would say, oh, my, uh, my dad's seen you running up the mountain this morning at five o'clock with <laughs> the Bergen on. <laughs> yeah, training, training. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is committed, but it's not normal. <laughs> and then we, you know, we'd, we'd camp out in the woods and yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good. And like, as you know, Wales, it's... Um, it's a beautiful landscape, plenty of places to go. Very, you know, beautiful place to, to grow up, really. Uh, so I suppose it was, all, you know, I was always destined for for that. Uh, yeah, I had a, I had a, such a distorted view. If I had what of what view I had of the military when I joined, I remember when I was in phase one, which at the time was in Litchfield, and we went on our first in inverted commas exercise. It's a one nighter. That was it. First time you go and set your poncho and all that, and I remember asking, and I remember asking the section commander, who was a guy called Al Watson. I don't know if you ever came across Al Watson. You yeah. came back with a tall, yeah, you know, yeah. B, he was a uh, B company. Yeah, yeah, he was my section commander, and I remember asking him as we got into this wood block, and I said, "Are we going to have fires tonight?" <laughs> <laughs> like I was thinking camping, and I I think back that I think, my, my God, I when I signed my name on that dotted line in the careers office, I had no clue about anything. Nothing about it. Knew nothing about it because I had no religion in the family. I think most people are like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's crazy. It's like, uh, so it sounds like you had a much better idea than I did going up the, ma- going up the, going up the mountain with fucking bird on the <laughs> So yeah. did you just decide that you, it just, that, that was what you were going to do? You had no influence. I, I wanted that. to join the military. I don't know why. I, initially, I wanted to join the RAF. I don't know why. I think I had a pilot in my head, maybe, or... No, 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 no. I remember being in secondary school, and we were looking at career options. I think it was in, like, year 10 or 11. And, yeah, it was... Yeah, it was, look, it was like that time you start looking at potential careers and different things. And there was a magazine from the military there, and I saw aircraft technician or something like that in there. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to do great on my GCSEs. I wasn't going to do bad, but I wasn't going to do great. And uh, that was our year. And I thought, oh, I'll do that. That sounds good. Because I had no, no family in the military at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I needed to go to college, get A-levels for that, and then join. But uh, I fucked college up. <laughs> Ended up leaving early. And and joined the Reg because there was an advert on TV that I'd seen for the Reg. Went down and did a 24, 24 hours with the Paris. Got fucking brainwashed and poor bright. <laughs> yeah, this is mega. And then uh, and then joined up that way. But um, yeah, I had no military. I don't. I, that must be then where it came. I'm just thinking of that now. Why I even thought military must have been seen that RAF job in the magazine, aircraft technician or something like that. It was something like that. Yeah, but I think it was also a lack of options. Also, I wasn't happy with myself. I didn't like who I was. I was quite... Uh, I had real low self-confidence, real low self-esteem. I was really quiet. Um, I wasn't comfortable in, like, social situations. I didn't... I, I just... I felt... I felt, like, weak, I think. And I think I sort of... You know, what I saw myself as not who I wanted to be as a man. I was nothing like my dad or my mother. They're not... They're quite confident people. Um, they're, like, really personal, personal people people liked them got on with them you know like they're just good people yeah and, and they know how to interact and socialise with people they're nice to be around uh, most of the time um, although ironically by that time they were both drinking heavily so sometimes they weren't nice to be around <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, and so I think I'd, I was joining to prove myself to myself I think you know hey I'm actually worth worth something yeah didn't quite work out like that initially. <laughs> didn't quite work out like that, but did after time. So yeah, that's why. That's why. My sister joined up as well later on. Um, different different role though. But uh, what did your brother think if you joined the Reg then? Um, yeah, he. I mean, like I say, he's a lot older than me. So um, yeah, he was proud. He. He didn't, he didn't try and persuade you otherwise. Uh, no, not really. I remember. Um, <laughs> I remember I was probably 12 I just joined the cadets and um, I remember I, I remember I needed to tell him I wanted to join the Paris <laughs> I was so nervous about it 
I remember in my bedroom writing a letter to, to him saying, oh, you know, I just, this is really what I want to do. And I hope, you know, hope that you will um, give me your blessing. And, um, but yeah, he's, he, he was, was proud. And I think by the time that I actually joined, he'd left the Marines uh, and he comes to the pass out and everything. Um, so yeah, he was, yeah, big supporter. Um, yeah. How did you find the reg? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Like I say, um, give, I got a lot from it. Uh, I mean, I'm so young, it feels like a lifetime ago now. Um, you joined at 16, yeah? Yeah, 16. Oh, no. So I remember going to the careers office and they were trying to steer me in the direction of the foundation college. But, um, I said, no, no, I want to... You Why know, did you say no? Because in my mind, I wanted to do the sausage factory, you know, week one, day one. I didn't want to spend a year in in uh, Harrogate. Um, so I had to wait a few more months. I think it was 16 and nine months or whatever it was till you were, you could the earliest that you could join. Um, yeah, and it was just, I mean, it was just one big adventure really at that age because you're still a, you're still a kid, aren't you? Um, yeah, some of the screws used to say, I've got holes in my t-shirt older than you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it, you know, it made me grow up, uh, made, made a man out of me. Um, it was, it was, you know, it was great. And at that age, you, things like injuries and it, 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 I didn't, Fortunately, it didn't touch me because you're still you're still you're still so young and resilient. Um, I'm not saying it was easy. Um, it wasn't easy by any means, but it was like one big adventure for a 16 year old, uh, especially coming from a small town. You know, just being able to do these uh, extraordinary things that you wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to do. Um, so yeah, it was it was good. What did you find most difficult about depot training? Um, what did I find most difficult? It, what I was ve- I was very fit when I joined um, because of all the training on the beach and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I was already at that time, um, like I say, when my sister met her second husband. Um, a lot of the time, I lived in the flat by myself from a young age. So I could cook, I could iron, I could look after myself. I didn't feel homesick at all. Um, I mean, I never used to go back home. On the, week, the weekends that you have off, I just used to either stay on the camp or I'd go to somebody else's um, hometown for the weekend. Um, so, yeah, I mean, probably <clears throat> learn to live in the field. You know, it was... Some of the conditions up in Otterburn were quite, quite, quite tough at that time, which would have been, been like December, January time. You know, tough, hot, hard on the body. I actually went down with um, suspected hypothermia on Dynamite Mole. <laughs> I remember digging into hot, frozen solid mud that was filling with water. So they're digging in defensive phase, and. Um, I was just losing my mind. I remember looking at the grass and just hallucinating and seeing weird and wonderful colours. And then the next thing I remember is being in a sleeping bag and being given some hot chocolate. And I remember thinking, oh, fuck, that's me. I've failed right at the end of training. They took us to uh, a medical clinic, like a hospital. And it was my entire trench that, that went down. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it weren't the entire... I think there was about three of us. Um, well, the trench is only four. Yeah, so it was <laughs> two or three. It weren't the entire trench, but it's all the ones doing all the graft, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just obviously piss wet through. Um, and they run some tests and they said, we're happy for you to go back on the exercise. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no that so, would never happen to me. I know, literally put the same piss wet through trousers and clothes back oh, on God. and then went back on and but it was worth it because I wasn't you know, past I wasn't back squatted or anything I just missed a few hours of 
Uh, it's hard going. It's ha- that final exercise is hard going in January in Otterburn. Yeah, for people who aren't aware, Dynamo Mole is the name of the final exercise in parachute regiment training. Uh, like 10 days long. Two weeks, isn't it? Yeah. 10 days? 10 days? Um, like 12, day, 12 days, maybe. Is it? I know, in Otterburn, yeah. I, do you know what? I can barely remember. I, I yeah. can't remember anything about Dynamo Mole. And I think I just blocked that from my mind. It's the most, the most <laughs> horrendous, mechanism. horrendous experiences. It is just freezing cold and sleep deprivation and physical exertion for 10, 11 days. I'm, I'm trying to remember any of it. I can't yeah. remember any of it. I feel, um, my, I mean, my memory is, is terrible. I just, I remember snippets, but um, I remember, I, I do remember afterwards um, the staff actually saying do you know what those conditions were actually horrendous so you did well even though we got we got shit for it at the time um so stevie q was my uh my screwing depot <laughs> um i think he was the only one from three para and uh stevie q <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Um, well, you'll know from the com- you know the company. Oh, yeah, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Steve. I should say. Yeah. Um, oh, but hell. yeah, on the pass out play, they did actually say they they were horrendous conditions. You know, take it back. You, you did well. Um, so yeah, probably that. And just being at that, at that young age, I've probably not been exposed to sleep deprivation. I mean, if you've not, for anyone that's not experienced sleep deprivation, it is it destroys you you know um, with all the best will in the world a couple of days without sleep and you just start shutting down um, well I think anyone can do a couple of days without sleep it's when you couple a couple of days without sleep and the physical and the physical exertion and the mental exertion yeah. because when you know we, you and I could do two days without sleep now and just stay up I would not have any drama with that whatsoever I'd be tired tomorrow right I'd be <laughs> yeah. like you know like 30 30 hours in I'd be like I need to fucking sleep I'd be hard going but then if you then to drop on me oh throughout that entire time f- extreme physical exertion extreme weather conditions and then the mental exertion of you have to think tactically you have to be constantly thinking about what you're doing where you where, where your kit and equipment is what you're doing next where your, t- where your team members are you know what the what the plan is, how you're going to administrate yourself, how to look after yourself. You can't just be a vegetable and vegetate on the couch for 48 hours. You are grafting in every possible sense of the word. And then in training or on an exercise like that, you're being tested. You have to be at the peak of your ability constantly and for 10 fucking days. Oh my God, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. When I think about the military, sorry, sorry. When I think about the military, I think, yeah, man. I think, do I miss it? Would I go back? I think, and I think, I, I make myself remember those horrific times ago. I don't miss that. I don't miss being freezing cold and knackered and wet on some exercise. Operation's different. Yeah. Operation's different. I'll do it on operation. There was a reason for it. On exercise, oh, no, I don't want that anymore. I'm too old, mate. Yeah, I don't I know. Want it. I'm the same. Built for comfort. Gone are the days of being cold and wet. <clears throat> Um, I don't. I, I enjoy a, a nice bath or a cold shower for a short period, but um, yeah, I'd never, you know, TA or anything. I'd never um, appeals to me. Um, yeah, for the, for those reasons. I met up with uh, a mate on uh, a power edge mate on a uh, last weekend. I haven't seen him in ages, and uh, he's he's two three now, um, and he's what. 43 years old <laughs> like, I mean fair play but then he was describing about an, like a, an OP they put in an exercise OP they put in I was thinking in my head I was thinking cold wet sleep deprived okay I get it like I get it and being part of 2-3 Ali but also uh, cold wet sleep deprived <laughs> oh no 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 thank you not anymore no, you only um, you only think you only think of the the, the good times, um, but yeah, when you think back to the like I said, the cold and the wet, the you know the being on stag, it's not for me, not now, no. <clears throat> so you did. So did you do Herrick for? So you did Herrick in Afghan two thousand six and Afghan two thousand eight. Um, no, so I did. Um, yes, yeah, so Northern Ireland, 
was the first one. When did you join up? Oh five. Uh, oh two. Oh two. Sorry, yeah. of course it was oh two. Yeah, I apologize. So yeah, it yeah, yeah. was the yeah the the marching season in West Belfast, which was two thousand and four. Was it two thousand four? Yeah. Um, that was the year we were out there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Iraq. Um, did the, the Iraq War? Not the invasion. The uh, it was Telic Six. It was, I think not not that the whole battalion went. It was C Company. But I went attached as as guns, as, you yeah. Know, guns. Yeah, and then um, Afghan two thousand six, and then um, I left. I, I left in oh eight really, but I, my official date was in oh nine. Mm. Why did you leave? Um, I got. I was medically discharged um, for, for a few reasons. Um, one being post-traumatic stress or complexed um, post-traumatic stress um, which you'll, you'll know it wasn't really it wasn't really a thing then it wasn't as well known as it is um, now perhaps I don't know I certainly didn't know any anything about it um, so it, yeah it was the right time for me to, to move on um, what were the symptoms? did you know you had it? no no. So how do you get identified? So, who did um, you fill in? No, I'm <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> myself mostly. <laughs> I shouldn't joke about it. No. Yeah. So uh, we, um, we we come back, um, and at the time, my, 06 came back. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Come back in 06. and at the time, my my ex wife was pregnant with my son. Um, two weeks after. Do you mind me asking? No. Okay. No. No. Yeah, no, yeah, I'll just, um, yeah, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, so my son was born about two weeks after we got back. Um, so all the all the emotions that come with being a father come with that, along with processing everything that just happened over the last, you know, five or six months. Um, I then went on the pre-beat-up that you do for D&Ds, and um, I come off the eight miler. My my um, my shins were in agony. Not my shins. It was uh, there was a swelling in both of my legs. My feet went completely numb. And it's, it takes eight, eight miles back here, right? Exactly. Um, and it was called it was compartment syndrome. I don't know if you've, you've heard of it, so it cuts off like circulation. Anyway, that was the catalyst for what what happened uh, after that. So had operation at. Um, Headley Court, where they, they they cut into cut four incisions into my calf muscles, and the way that uh, ex- the doctor explained it to me was your muscles expand in almost like the the membrane you'd get on a sausage, and it'll cut the circulation off. You know, absolute worst case scenario amputation, but in most cases it's, it's fine. Anyway, it was you know Bukshi really had an operation. Um, so then, whilst I was recovering from that, I had uh, I had um, a mole um, that my wife at the time was mithering me about. It just looked like a freckle. So I was recovering from the compartment syndrome operation, and I went to the doctor purely just to um, a piece stop her. her from mithering me. And um, they said, "Oh, it's skin cancer." It's um, malignant melanoma, most aggressive form of skin cancer. Don't know how far it's spread, but you know we need to, you know, need surgery immediately, sort of thing. And um, bearing in mind, I lived in Saudi as a kid, and um, you know, I'm actually got the ginger gene, and I'm fair. I was in the sun a lot, <clears throat> um, so I thought, right, fucking hell, I, you know, um, survived. A horrendous five or six months and now I'm going to die of cancer so all these things were building up and then while I was waiting for surgery for that um, we come back from I went to the Army Navy rugby in the in the April uh, I was waiting for surgery come back and then went for a piss and I was pissing blood and um, I thought fucking hell it, like I thought it's <laughs> fucking I thought well, it's spread to my organs, you know, that's me sort of thing. Anyway, it turned out to be something completely unrelated. <clears throat> um, 
so at the time I was um when I come when I come back and all these things were happening I felt uh completely numb completely void of any feeling or emotion like I didn't feel anger I didn't feel sad um I just felt numb I didn't feel anything and uh so I developed um, a bit of a deranged, um, well, a coping, coping mechanism, I don't know. I was going to sound a bit weird, this, but <laughs> this is what I did. Um, so I used to order dozens of videos from online of people being executed. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking <laughs> hell. I was not expecting that. Okay, go on. So... And they were all from like America and China, and they were old. Um, what, do you, what do you mean? What, what do you mean online? What, DVDs? Yeah, uh, no. So they were actually old school VHS videos. <laughs> Couldn't get them in the UK, so I ordered them online, and it would just be like two hours of um, of people being executed all over the world in all kinds of horrendous ways. You know, set on fire, stonings, executions horrendous horrendous stuff and um I know it's, it gets a bit a bit dark so um and I wasn't sleeping so we were saying about you know lack but, 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 of sleep. why were you ordering us to feel something to try and make yourself feel something yeah because I just or did you know those would make you feel something well, I was hoping they would okay but they didn't so um so sorry sorry to just hang on yeah. so you recognise it was a problem that disassociation we call it yeah emotional disassociation I, yeah. I I experienced the same thing for a long time so I know exactly what you're talking about exactly the same thing it's not comfortable knew it wasn't good knew it wasn't correct but also I kind of preferred that to the alternative of feeling possibly bad or feeling anything that would ex- that would weaken me okay weaken my resilience because if I don't feel anything nothing can make me feel bad <laughs> yeah. makes sense yeah yeah so it's like okay this isn't good but also it's got it's got its pros <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. um so you recognize that and you were trying to change that right yeah i i, f- I felt like um i felt like i was just walking. correct me if i'm wrong i'm assuming no yeah you're, okay. you're absolutely right i, I wanted to feel something because i felt like i was broken emotionally my I, you know just so as well as that I thought I was dying of cancer and uh, in a warped way I thought that some of the stuff that happened in Afghanistan I'm, I'm not saying anything illegal I thought that my destiny was to die of a you know a painful crippling chronic disease and I know it sounds it's sad it sounds weird now but that was what I believed and um and then I wasn't th- I wasn't sleeping because I was just thinking constantly about all sorts of stuff, um, probably childhood stuff I'd not dealt with, stuff in Afghan. I thought I was dying anyway, and I wasn't sleeping just because I think I've heard you use the analogy of um, a pinball in, uh, in your mind, and it's it's exactly true. Um, and so I ordered these videos, um, and I would just lie awake at night. My wife would be in bed and I would just stare and watch every single detail and I didn't feel anything and I was just used to think well this isn't normal because what I'm seeing now is not normal it's you know graphic it's not you shouldn't be seeing it but it didn't, it didn't bother me it didn't feel, I didn't feel anything and then um, so this went on over a period of months um, and then it come to a head um, so I had a married quarter in Colchester and my wife at the time or um, invited her sister and her brother-in-law around and we were drinking I was drinking quite heavily at that point anyway just to try and quiet the voices in my mind and we were drinking quite heavily and um, <clears throat> we were in the kitchen and uh, my sister-in-law and I started play fighting just shadow boxing in the kitchen you know, we pissed to listen to music, and um, so I was holding my guard up, and she was throwing a few jabs, and we were kind of laughing and joking, and then um, 
she caught me with um, a ring or a knuckle on the side of my head and it it hurt and um, it was the first thing I'd felt in a long time and it was the pain and then um, just, it was just this rush of emotions could just come from you know come from my stomach because I could because I could feel something and then um, I just started leathering myself <laughs> I was just um, clenched fists I was just smashing myself in the face as hard as I could and I, I cut my lip I bust my nose I just you know crying uncontrollably and um, so it, you know, it must have been horrific for them to watch. And my brother-in-law, he uh, he leapt up from the kitchen table. He threw his arms around me like a like a bear hug. And um, you know, I was just like crying, and, and I fell against the side of the kitchen top. And I looked up, and um, I could just see the handle of the kitchen knife. So. I pulled it out of the, the sheath and um, I just slashed, started slashing at my wrists. Um, and uh, yes, fucking blood was everywhere and I was just crying uncontrollably. And, um, you know, they were saying, uh, they were just saying, uh, we'll get you the help that you need. Did you missus know before that that you were fucked? Um, do you want a minute? Do you want a minute? No, I'm all right. <laughs> no, I want to. I want to tell it. Uh, uh, she just, you know, I, I probably wasn't myself. Like I say, I just felt like I was in a perpetual dream. I just nothing felt real, and I could, I couldn't feel anything. I just felt numb. So um, she said, you know, we'll get you the help that we need. So she called the um, she called the guard room. And as luck would have it, um, my mate was on, was the guard commander, and it was Mark Stott, if you remember Stott. Yeah, yeah. Stott. And uh, <laughs> he come to the house. He must have thought, what the fuck has happened here? Now, he should have called the police, probably. But um, my wife, so my, my son was only a few days old at this point. Oh, so you're literally just back? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. I didn't realise he was that soon Yeah, after. no, okay. sorry, not a few days old. So, no, that's wrong. He must have been a couple of months old. Okay. A couple of months. So not long after back, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, and she she left the house with him because <clears throat> she didn't trust me to be, she didn't want to be in the house. Although, the anger was at myself, was at nobody else. And... Um, she went to stay at her dad's for the night and uh, uh, Stott, he stayed there and he stagged on me while I slept on the sofa. Um, and, uh, and then the next day, she... I don't know whether she got in touch with the medical clinic or whether it went through the reg and they referred me to a psychologist um, and all the stuff with my cancer was still going on and my pissing blood um, and he was really good the psychologist and th this is where the the start of my now book started because I said to, you know he said um, he asked me to talk about certain um, situations and I said well there are several but it's more it's more than that it's it just, I can't remember half of the half of the stuff um, and he said write it down he said don't worry about the quality of the writing the spelling he said just in chronological order just start writing from day one go into Afghan it's coming back and it was very um, cathartic is that the word you know it was very therapeutic uh, that's how it started. Anyway, we decided that um, I was going to be discharged and I was still being investigated for the, for the cancer and the piss and blood. Um, so the cancer, they had, a sur had surgery, um, had another biopsy 
and then I had to have a second surgery. But I didn't have to have any radiation, uh, chemo or anything like that. So they, they got it early, although they said that I'd be high risk because of um, so much time in the sun. Um, and then I was being investigated for my, what was my kidneys. So I was discharged from, from the military um, and I was seeing a neurologist, uh, not neurologist, not neurologist, a, thropic, a, kidney, a renal doctor, renal consultant okay. in Cambridge. And it turned out I had a rare kidney disease. So they said, there's no known cause. It's, it's common in um, Asian men. Um, they said it could, it could have, you could have had it from birth. You could have caught it over there. They don't know. They, they would never be able to, to prove it. But it was, um, the body would att was attacking the kidneys. And eventually, there's no known cause. Eventually, you will go into renal failure and have a kidney transplant. We don't know when that will be. It could be 20 years down the line. It could be in six months. The, all they do is manage the condition. And some of the symptoms were very high blood pressure. Um, and then I would, they would monitor the scarring on the kidney. Um, and it took 10 years, but eventually I ended up going into renal failure. Fucking uh, hell. So you had that going on at the same time as the skin cancer, the same time as the post-traumatic stress? Yeah, yeah. And I was in, and, uh, oh my God. I was in crutches because of the uh, up on my leg. <laughs> and the com uh, com compartment syndrome. Yeah, the compartment syndrome. <laughs> so it was a lot. It, it was a lot that happened in a short space of time. That is unbelievable. Um, but, uh, I mean, fast forward in a bit, but my sister saved my life. She gave me a kidney. Um, no way. Yeah. Yeah. So 10 years down the line, I, I, um, I was fine. I mean, I, you know, as you know, I went into other lines of work, which I'm sure we'll come on to. So that was only five years ago you had that transplant. Yeah, 2017. Wow. 2017. Um, oh, 2017. Okay, seven years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, yeah, 2017. So um, I was fine. Uh, you know, I, they monitored the, the, the kidney. It was it was fine. And then uh, towards the end, the last year, it just <coughs> went rapidly downhill. And that was the catalyst for me stopping the line of work that I was doing as a consultant abroad overseas um, security consultant for the media close protection that, that sort of line of work which uh, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into so I came back um, and I was on dialysis for probably about eight months you know we go go three times a week they plug you into the machine for four hours at a time and it's like a washing machine cleanses your blood pumps it back into you um, and then yeah, my sister said, I want to give you a kidney. So she's a little living donor. She was a perfect match. Um, within a week of me having the transplant, I was out of the hospital. I felt like reborn. What do you um, mean? What do you mean? Because well, with the kidney disease, yeah, so it's called IJ nephropathy. Um, so your all the toxins in your blood that your kidney should filter out um, through urine, you know, they should cl cleanse your blood. They weren't working. There was a buildup of toxins in, my, in, in the blood from uh, creatinine, which is like a byproduct of a muscle breakdown, potassium, which is lethal in high doses. So your body is poisoning itself from the inside. You know, and I stop. I stopped pissing, you know, your body's just, you're, you're dying slowly. And it just felt like... What, you wouldn't need to go to the toilet? No, no. How long was that for? Um, and, and while I was on dialysis. Ah. Um, all your fluid in, input, output was controlled. And, you, you know, you slowly die. And I started losing my vision in one eye. Um, my heart felt like it was constantly going to be out of my chest. Really? Uh, I, I thought I was going to have a heart attack at any any moment. Um, and you just feel like the worst possible hangover you've had, along with sleep deprivation, you, f you feel like that all the time when, you, when, you, when your kidneys um, shut down. 
and then when you have dialysis you start to feel some kind of normality but um, from the moment I woke up uh, I felt brand new I felt good as new again uh, yeah it was it's, you know it's, it's bloody incredible what they do so the, the consultant <clears throat> he's uh, an Iranian guy amazing guy and um, they took it was it up in Manchester and they took my sister into surgery in the morning um, and it was like he was just going to buy a cup of coffee he did the surgery on the sister on my sister <laughs> came into me washing his hands he said I'm just going to have a, have a sandwich how long did it take on your sister? oh I think it's like four hours something like that. Like <laughs> but he, he came into my uh, hospital bed as casual as anything he said I'm just gonna you know have a sandwich get something to eat and then we'll get you in get the kidney in you you know just like it was just an everyday thing um, yeah he was a, he was amazing and my last thought before they put me into theatre um, of course you, your mind plays tricks on you and I had my, my wife there um my brother was there and I thought if anything goes wrong because there's always that small chance of things going wrong I thought the last the last image I want of them of me to be is me getting pushed in lying down on a hospital bed so I said to the nurses I want to walk into the surgery push the bed next to me I'll walk on my own two feet and then I'll get on the bed when we're inside. So the last picture they had was me walking into the surgery with my ass hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, yeah, I was, you know, I was fine and I'm fine now. You know, I go a couple of times a year, they monitor my um, my blood, um, but I'm, you know, fine and fit. I'm you know, operational firefighter. Um, it's incredible what they do absolutely incredible yeah and he's I mean with that attitude coming in and taking it so blase he's, he's underplaying it isn't he he's trying to keep you calm he's putting you in the right situation <laughs> <laughs> it's totally normal I'm going to rip this uh, vital organ out of your body and replace it with someone from somebody else <laughs> yeah. totally normal yeah cut you up yeah easy peasy it's crazy it's amazing what they can do medically these days can I ask a question so um Given the nature of uh, the way you were discharged from the reg, how on earth did you end up in the organisation you ended up in? Which I know you can't talk about much, but we can say what it was. Yeah, I can allude to it, yeah. Um, Because from my perspective, if I went and applied for, if I thought MI5 would be a good organisation to go and join... I'd be thinking, there's no fucking way I'm getting in there. You're being discharged in the wrench for PTSD. Yeah, I mean... How does that come about? So, uh, I was in the clear for the cancer. Um, at this time, the the kidney issue, it they were just monitoring it. I mean, they said it could last a lifetime and you'll be fine. So... Um, and I was, you know, I was still being, um, I was still seeing someone to do with the complex PTSD. And the stuff that I did with a psychologist helped a lot. It helped me develop uh, coping mechanisms, make sense of things from uh, my childhood. And also the, the, the change of environment, a new sense of purpose and a direction, it did wonders for me. And I do think that, um, I don't know whether it was initially just a, a post-traumatic stress, not a disorder, because of all the things that were going on, coupled with um, some of the horrendous things in Afghanistan. And it, you know, it helped a lot. So yeah, I, um, I did my settlement. Initially, I thought I'll go down the, the CP route, like what a lot of um, uh, lads did. They were leaving the reg, um, so I went and did a course in Hereford. I don't think the company's still going anymore. Uh, Abacus, Abacus. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, brilliant course. And at the same time, um, I was applying to get into the security services. But how did that come on your radar, though? Um, so when I knew that I was going to be discharged, I applied for loads of things. I applied for the Met Police. I applied for the prison service apply for the security services and it's all done online written application initially uh, and then there's you know there's various stages and interviews and assessments 
um, the first one that that came available to me was actually the prison service uh, and I was going to go to Wormwood Scrubs and be a prison officer uh, and I never thought anything about getting in the security services I thought I'd never get anywhere you know I left school with no qualifications head full of mints you know hex red bloke um, and I was progressing further and further in the application stages um, and then so I decided that I made a decision to cancel the prison service I cancelled the stuff with the Met I'd already done the, the CP course at this stage and I was looking at exploring options there anyway I was accepted in um, <clears throat> for obvious reasons I can't go into the nature of the work that I was involved in but I wasn't there for a lot, a, a great deal of time, um, a number of years, uh, and without going into it, the the area of work I wanted to go into, um, I didn't have certain qualifications or a level of education that I wanted, and it was an issue of time and money. And at th that time, in '09. Uh, I knew of a lot of guys that were on the circuit earning mega bucks, and I was only what was that this time twenty three. I was still a young guy. Of course, you could um, join at sixteen, didn't you? My I joined, yeah, God. joined early. So all of that, and still only twenty three. Like, up <laughs> yeah. to that point, we're still only twenty three. So, oh God. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. So not not many people um, knew my sister. Knew I had a conversation. Um, it seemed ridiculous at the time to throw away a career. But um, it gave me perspective. It gave me access to a lot of opportunities, um, and I still had in the back of my mind that the these people that we all knew were in mega bucks in Iraq and all these all these places. Um, so it's someone that I someone that I knew. Um, she was a Kurdish translator, and she put me in touch with a high net worth family in London and I made the decision to, to leave and pursue that line of work um, here in London so yeah I worked for a family directly to the family uh, close protection bodyguarding you know the stuff that um, it, I mean ultimately wasn't what I thought it wasn't what I envisaged in in my mind, as, as you <laughs> know. Is, yeah, you know, know, it's you know, it's not like what you'd see on a film. Um, great pay, great um, experiences, um, but I still I still wanted to scratch that itch of going out to the Middle East. So I was looking at um, doing anti piracy as well as going out to Iraq. I was I was sort of pursuing two things and. My brother being an ex-bootneck, he got me on a course in Limpstone to do anti-piracy. I forget the name of the quality needed now. And he blagged um, a P number, a marine number for me. And I mean, I was compromised on the first day that I went there. And it, and it was fine. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Explain that to me again. He blagged a, P, he blagged a, 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 uh, a bootneck ID number for Yes. Yeah. So th it was a military course? No. So it was a course. Um, it was the company was called Salam Fakira. Uh, a, a guy Conrad. Thorpe. Is your brother still in? No, no. He, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and it was all it, basically. He had a good friend at Limpstone, and he said, "You know, my brother's trying to get on the circuit. Any chance you get me place on this course?" And the purse said, "Yeah, no, no drama." put him down on this um, is this is his number so I didn't have to pay for the course so they were um, giving it free to bootnecks yeah right um, and I, like I said I was compromised on the first day and, and they were they were fine about it how um, so I asked what time scoff was because oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the course is like five days long and as you'll know Bootnecks don't say scoff, they say scram. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> and it was all, yeah, it was all, you know, it was all fine. A five day course. Um, and at the time, uh, the anti piracy stuff wasn't armed. It was just starting to kick off um, 
So this would have been 2011, 2010, 2011. Um, and then an opportunity came for me to go to Iraq on a, on a, on the, the contract, on the PSD contracts that we all, you know, that we, we know um, <clears throat> in the oil and gas industry. So I went out there. Um, Where were you? Uh, Basra. Whereabouts? Um, I was. It was on. It was in the oil fields. I went out in twenty. Uh, I went out in twenty eleven. Yeah. So control risks. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I can't forget the name of the compound now. Near the air ba- near the airport. Oh, in Basra. Yeah. Oh, we don't know where that. Was. Okay, right. Yeah. Right. Um, I forget the name of the. No. Fire something. Lightning something. It was anyway. Yeah, and then they had a series of. Um, camps on the oil fields didn't yeah. they so and it, yeah it, it was great there was still bits and pieces of stuff going on but it wasn't you know like it, like it was back in the early 2000s um, but yeah it was great so I did that for uh, four years yeah four years at the time I was um, well pretty much not long after leaving the the, the reg or getting discharged um, my first wife and I separated um, it was amicable it was amicable she put up with a lot I mean I was not you know weren't the best person to be around um, to the at the point before I before I was discharged you know I was drinking every night probably bordering on al- al- you know being an alcoholic um, just with everything that was going on uh so yeah, so we 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 went went our separate ways. So yeah, I was working out in Iraq, and then I rented a villa in Thailand. So I used to go out over there on my time off. I'd spend half of my leave with my son who was in school, so I'd take him away, or I'd rent a hotel in um, in Brentwood. It was at the time, um, and then I had a villa in Thailand. So used to spend my time off out there and I got into Muay Thai oh, nice. um, as well as the you know the the party inside of it as well uh, in between rotations and it was brilliant um, how often were you training Muay Thai? I applied for sponsorship through um, a company called Tiger Muay Thai so I boxed in the in the reg that's how I know uh, John, John we were talking about before I, I boxed it as a as a kid, uh, a young age. Went on to box for the three para, um, and I knew a few people that were getting involved in in Muay Thai. So I applied for a sponsorship, but I, did, I didn't get it. I mean, I, I had half a dozen fights, uh, and there were you know there were, there were guys out there that were they had a MMA record, MMA record. They were grapplers, and but I you know, chanced my uh, chanced my arm at it. Um, yeah, so if, if I was there for a couple of months or a month, I'd just I'd probably do three or four sessions a week. But then I was going out in the evening as well. You know, <laughs> what, you know what it's like, you know, especially as a left as a young Tom, uh, and then having this money, your exposure, and no, you know, no ties, and um, as in relationship ties. Um, yeah, so I, I probably didn't take it as serious as I, sh- as I should have. Um, but no, it was, a, it was a great experience. I know it's changed a lot now, that that side of the industry. What do you mean? Do you mean? Um, longer ro- uh, longer rotations. The oh, money the changed. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I met my my wife at the moment. I was still working over there. I mean, this is eleven years ago. Eleven years ago, um, and then. I had an opportunity to, or I ended up going freelance. So I started training um, and involving consultancy uh, on a freelance basis. So I, was, I, 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 um, I met my wife, got lived up. I didn't want to be away for long periods of time. Um, so I did it on a freelance basis, I do a few <coughs> weeks here, a month here, which was as you know it's it's harder in a lot of ways because you're always chasing work and you've got to do this this shit jobs to get onto the better jobs um 
but it was it was brilliant um so we used to run there's a couple of companies i worked for one one hereford um and another x1 para guy and we would run hostile environment training for ngos government agencies um journalists we'd run a two-week course anything from uh, resistance to interrogation contact drills weapons awareness um remote area trauma like pre-hospital trauma care and it was brilliant i loved it and there was also an option to go deploy with these organizations as an advisor on the ground um which which was brilliant um yeah so the, la- the last one that i did um before my kidneys failed was into Mosul when um, Iraqi Special Forces and the Peshmerga they Hmm. were taking Mosul back from from ISIS in 2016 2016 Um, so I was looking after an American news team um, and it was brilliant it was as it was happening in the news uh, we based at the uh in Erbil and we were one bound uh behind the 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 Peshmerga fighters so they'd go in clear a village and then um would go in as a news team they'd do a piece of camera and then we'd chase some other other stories but um Peshmerga the Kurdish yeah Kurdish um yeah Kurdish fighters uh it it is brilliant I, I you know one it's one part of the the work that I miss is the the travelling, and you know the different experiences that you have. What were the Peshmerga like compared to the Iraqi SF? Well, from our point of view, um, where we were on the in Western Mosul, they were, the, they were pushing us ISIS back towards the city, and it was very kinetic. It was you know just as it was it was going, and they were the ISIS were, were leaving booby traps in the tunnels and. Um, the Peshmerga were doing all the fighting um, where we were, and then the, the Iraqi special forces would come behind them on like a you know clear up operation. Then, I, then once they got into the city, I think they become a bit more involved. But they were they were brilliant. I mean, they wanted the world to see what 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 they were doing because two years previously, ISIS walked through Mosul with little to no resistance, so they wanted the world to see. So they were very welcoming to us um um yeah they were they, they were great you know there was we, we would just bounce about from place to place um and then i come back from that and i ran a course on the syrian border um for syrian journalists and then it was after that that my kidneys deteriorated which syrian border with iraq uh, Turkish Syria border, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, just outside of Idlib, towards Gaziantep. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, really good. But it was that was um, that was a course for freelance Syrian journalists that were working in Aleppo. Um, and when I actually when I came back from that course, uh, flew into Manchester Airport, and my passport was rejected. So <clears throat> tried it in the you know in the scanner as you do a few times and then um two plain clothes police officers escorted me to a room and they they thought I was fighting over there. They thought I'd joined, you know, um uh I was fighting against ISIS. They just you know, they were just inquiring as to what I was doing over there to prove the company, who we were working for um so yeah and then it was that point that uh my the, the my kidneys deteriorated so i thought right let's do something different here mm. um is that yeah. so what was that then fire service after that yeah yeah um so yeah transplant was 2017 and i joined the fire service in 2019 how old are you now 39 okay yeah yeah 39 yeah so two years after 2019 yeah 2019 <laughs> um <laughs> so wild ride mate 
when you think yeah. about you know <laughs> and you think about everything uh, that you, I mean even just when you look at if you just to take the military experience in isolation I mean the, the tour is you think about what young how young we are a lot of people are when they do just a, even just one tour anywhere you think fucking hell it's a lot to do in such a young age think about a, a 17 year old eight, well an 18 year old 19 year old going on a tour and you're cramming out all the extra stuff that you've done it um I think it either makes you or breaks you you know you either come out of that a broken individual with a very skewed look in the world and um I'm wanting nothing but peace and tranquility and routine and very little surprises should we say mm-hmm. or you kind of roll with it and crack on you know yeah I'd like to say like I said at the start <clears throat> my uh, story isn't unique there's you know any number of um, I don't not, know not just military Andy I don't know if that's a true, <laughs> true today I would suggest it is pretty you know I, if you don't want to say it's unique it's rare very rare did you not say? Um, I suppose it's that um, that voice of self worth of. I mean, the, the 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 thing with the book, I wasn't going to do it for a number of years. It's come back and forth because I thought there's always somebody that's done longer, more tours, done more stuff. Um, but ultimately, like we said at the start, the, your story is unique to you. And all, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't really care what people think. It was important for me to to, to get it out there. Um, Why? It was so. So the process of writing it was very therapeutic. Um, as I said, it started. It, it started with Herrick Four, and then I applied <clears throat> the same logic to stuff of the childhood. Um, I started writing about stuff in the. You know, as a freelance close protection work, including um, like surveillance stuff, so number of undercover stuff I was involved with, um, and I thought it's you know it's, it's an interesting story for somebody to read, and I I wanted to write it for to give to my son because there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that I've not told my family or my my son, and I thought. What, what, how amazing something to hand down to, to my son that he can give to his children and I thought if if, if I I mean my my grandparents um, they all died before I was born but um, if one of them had written a book it, it wouldn't matter if it was a terrible book I'd love to read it because it's a snapshot into the past you know I'm sure in years to come um the conflicts that we were involved with will not be spoken about as much so I thought it was important to get them stories onto paper um, so yeah I rolled with it but as an independent author so I've you know, done it all myself basically just getting advice and guidance from a few people uh, when did you release it? It's gonna. it's due for release end of September oh is it end of September so um, yeah I'm looking forward to it are you nervous about it going out (laughs) yeah yeah. well you're you are um, you're opening yourself up to the to the world some you know some of your deepest darkest secrets and there 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 comes a vulnerability with that Um, but I think that you have to be you have to be comfortable in your own skin. Ultimately, as we were saying before, it's it's my perspective. It's my you know it's that that's new, unique to me. Um, and I've no I'm not ashamed about putting it out there. You know this, this the the PTSD stuff. I, I strongly feel that more people should be talking about it. I know so many so many guys that we were in with who have struggled and as I'm sure you do um, but at, at the time it was um, it just wasn't you know you, it was almost like a sign of weakness I felt to to you know to let that known that, that be known about yourself yeah I think that was a misperception on our part I think, I, I think it was generally what was considered 
um, and it probably still is to a certain extent now a little bit but not like it was back then and I think the you know we had that misperception of that largely because of the lack of understanding and knowledge of it so you know it's, it's important like you just alluded to it there it's really important for I think people who are willing to share their experiences about anything be that growing up without your parents be that experiencing PTSD be that X, Y, or Z other thing that is hard to deal with I think it's important to share experiences so that people who haven't had the advantage of uh, so, so that knowledge can be shared and so if someone ends up going through it themselves or someone close to them does they can handle it better you know and I think back during those times my my uh, my struggle started about the same time as yours did straight after that tour and um, it's one of the reasons I started the podcast I had so many in those years where I was at my worst I had so many if I'd known this back then if I'd known this new piece of information I've just learned mm. two years ago five years ago six years ago eight ten years ago my god I would have found things a lot easier I wouldn't have had to go through these such difficult times if only someone had said that to me if only I'd learned this from somebody beforehand I would find it easier it's one of the reasons I started the podcast like you're saying it's one of the reasons you've done the book because ultimately in sharing that knowledge and experience it's going to help someone mm. you know this conversation and people listen to this and listen to you tell your story it's going to help someone at least one person right your book is going to help someone and if, if it only helps if it only ever helps with your book and the entire time it's out there if it only ever helps one person that's enough that makes it that ju- to me that justifies it all same with the podcast if the podcast is only ever to help one person find life a little bit easier it justifies the entire thing all the effort you think? 100%. I think so because that help could be as significant as that is the that snippet of information someone gets from your book is the one thing that prevents the, a butterfly effect of them six months down the line taking their own life or being just financially fucked mm. or ending up in a divorce cause, because their relationship down the pan because they didn't know how to cope with what they were experiencing you know what I mean or a, a relationship with their children breaking down um, and by in saying this, I'm not. I don't mean to obligate everyone who has a bad experience with. Hey, you should share your story because <laughs> it's not the case, you know. And not everyone's comfortable doing that. And and what's important about people like yourself who write the book is, it's one thing to be willing to share a story. It's another thing to be able to articulate it in a way that will resonate and that people can get something from it. Not everyone can tell a story. Not everyone can articulate what, what they feel. Uh, not everyone can interpret their emotions and their experiences in a way that they can communicate to other people to help other people. That is a rare thing. It is a rare thing. Everyone has a hard time in their lives. Very few people can, people can communicate it well. And even fewer still want to communicate it and put their heart and soul on, on paper, communicating stories. Super important. You know, um, not knowledge is power. That really common phrase is power. And, and especially where you are trying to understand yourself and overcome adversity knowledge is the key if you haven't got a fucking clue if you if you experience something for the first time you have no knowledge of it whatsoever or very little PTSD for example like we did back then very little understanding of it knowledge of it then it's, you, it's difficult to overcome you know you fast forward yourself from then to experiencing what you experienced then in 06, 07 to now I'd argue that you'd have a very much easier time of it as in you'd you, we know now much easier about what it is, what you're experiencing, what the emotions mean. We know about where we can go and seek help. We know that um, we know just how many other people can experience these things and go through the same thing, which means, huh, I'm, you're less likely to think of yourself as weak. You know, less likely to think of yourself as imperfect. Less likely to think of yourself as a burden on the people around you, those you love and those you have to work with. You know. It's a, it's a big thing, mate. You know, I, it makes sense that you're nervous, but you should also be proud of it, you know. And it it doesn't... Um, the the PTSD side of things, f- for me anyway, it doesn't, um, it doesn't always go away. As, as you know, I, you know, I'll have bad days, I'll have good days, but because of what you've just mentioned, the... You know the experiences. I'm I'm older, more knowledge. I'm better equipped to cope, to deal with it. I know 
I know my triggers, I know when I'm having a bad day, I know how to <clears> turn <throat> the tide in, in, into my, you know, to my favour. Um, well, that's a... Uh, so, that is a... There is a misconception that PTSD can't be fixed. So for people, for some people it can, some people it can't. And same with complex PTSD. For some people it can, some people it can't. But there is a misconception that it, it, for everyone it is, a, is not fixable. Um, and I think uh, that is something that people need to realise. I'm not saying I'm suggesting it for yourself, but there is, again, common with other, other mental issues, there are things that can be overcome that we know now that we didn't used to. PTSD is a prime example. So, for example, you know, I've interviewed a couple of um, experts on some cutting-edge uh, um, research and treatment of PTSD and PTSD-related symptoms. Mandy Bostwick being one, Mark Gordon being another. And they are pioneering uh, a process where... No, let's rephrase that. They're pioneering a... A, a focus on the first analysis and treatment of someone who is exhibiting PTSD symptoms should be on assessing where their neuroendocrinology, uh, st- what the neuroendocrinological status is. So what their brain hormones are doing and what they shouldn't be doing, how they're regulating themselves, what the issue is with the brain horm- with the hormones in your brain before addressing the psychiatric psychological side of things which is something that's gone un, or it's been under focused on under focused not a word but I'm going to use it anyway under focused <laughs> on in the past and what they found is that um, there's an increasing number of people who are chronically suffering with like your phone, <laughs> are chronically suffering with um, PTSD symptoms and they can seem to find no way out of it you and I both know people who have been round the mill and all sorts of treatment. Um, they are suffering from PTSD and nothing's working. I I see the people. I know at least one at the moment. Life just goes down the fucking pan, and it's not because he hasn't been trying. It's because nothing's working for him, and everything's been tried apart from this line of treatment I've just been describing with with, with Mandy and Mark. Um, lost my train of thought there. What was I going you about? said about um, yeah the, the the treatment that's now available and people not having um, support network, I suppose for yeah, what the fuck was on that? <laughs> yeah so the, the the so so yeah so basically there are there are there is oh yeah that's right yeah like this chronic this perception of a chronic PTSD for example can't ever get away with it get can't ever get away from it. I think that's becoming less and less true and more, more and more people can return to a baseline of normality. Um, but these things take time and uh, and there's resistance against that at the moment, uh, mainly from psychiatrists and psychologists, but for different reasons. But, uh, it's, you know, it's just, it, it, we, you know, as time goes on, we learn more about medical issues and we, yeah. we can over, overcome things. But um, Have you listened or read to any of um, Gaber Mate? No, who's Gaber, that? Gaber Mate. He's a physician, but he um, he specialises in trauma, childhood trauma specifically. So he is the his parents. One of his parents were in Auschwitz, um, and yeah, he he went into um, psychology, and he 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 puts out some really interesting research in um, how childhood trauma can manifest itself later on in life um, but yeah he's I mean he's got, I think he's got his own podcast actually but no it's really interesting stuff um, I'd heard recently of the, ra- the rapid eye movement have you heard, heard of that I've never what about it so um, <clears throat> it's not I've not not something I've experienced but um, it's a new um, a new way of treating PTSD essentially um, so I'm not sure exactly how it works but it's um, yeah they seem to be having a lot of success with it you got any idea what the treatment is? 
Um, it, it's something to do with you. They make you think of an event, um, and then there's a series of exercises that you do, and you change the the perception or the narrative of that specific event. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's not something I've explored, but I know there's a lot more knowledge and research out there now. But I think as you get older, you know yourself better as well. You know, you, just, you know yourself better. But that's easy to say from a place where, um, you know, you have a fairly stable house, a, a, a job. Um, I think it's much harder if you're in a position where you're struggling to find work, you're financially struggling, <clears throat> you have nowhere to live, you have no support network, um, then it becomes much harder. Because what I what I found was that once you would sort of hit that rock bottom, it was easier to get there. If, they, if certain things fell apart in your, in your life. Uh, so for example, when my, my kidneys started deteriorating, I almost immediately went right back to rock bottom, how I was when we first got back, um, very easily. And then um, the, my mindset almost becomes self-destructive mindset. Um, but yeah, like, like I say, I think that as you get older, you know yourself better. You know what your triggers are. You know when you're having a bad day and what you can do to, to stop that becoming any worse or um, help somebody else mm. recognise it in somebody else that might not ordinarily see it in themselves I didn't have a destructive mindset I had a passive I'm not going to live much longer mindset and I remember in two cause we were experiencing the same thing about the same time that that um, what year did you get out 2011 so, so you did you you went back and did? Do you go back and do a second tour? Two, did three, did three. I did. Oh six, eight, oh eight, and okay. twenty ten. Yeah. But um, that second tour went out on. I was convinced that I wasn't going back. Mm. I like that year leading up to that. I, I heavily drinking like like yourself, and I remember I'd be fucking hammered, and I'd just be drinking and drinking and drinking. And in my head, I would, as a, consciously, I'd be thinking. I'd be imagining myself dropping dead from alcohol as I was drinking and I wasn't bothered by that I was like I'm just going to keep getting fucking hammered I can stay awake keep getting hammered and imagine myself yeah, dropping dead because I was I was, I was again because of that tour I thought there's no way I, I can't have got away with that right. <laughs> as in I can't still be after that and then I turned I turned 20 when did I turn 20 27 whenever I turned 27 that was 08 08 27 and then are you aware of the 27 club? no 27 club <laughs> yeah 27 club with a bunch of artists that all died when they were 27 Jimi Hendrix Amy Winehouse um, uh, Janis Joplin uh, um, who's the doors Jim Morrison Jim Morrison there's like Kurt Cobain all 27 what? years old, mate. Did not know this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 20, the 27 Club. 27, 27 Club, and yeah. And you were 27 at that I, time. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm getting a math wrong. <laughs> anyway, I was convinced I wasn't going back from your eight tour. Because I was like, that was the year I was going to be 27. 27 Club. I was like, no. Yeah. And I thought, there's no way I can get through another one. <laughs> like, your luck doesn't go that far. But in reality, yeah. you know, again, it goes back to perception. I'm not the only one. Obviously, I'm sitting opposite you. I'm not the only one who had a fucking crazy Torno 6. Loads of us did. Yeah. You know, loads of us had near-death experiences, multiple of, and I'm not the only one back in 08. You know, it's just, again, it's perception, but that's the way I was thinking, is the mindset. And I, I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel anything. I didn't feel joy. I didn't feel when something catastrophic happened at home, you know, one of the kids fucking hurts himself bad, or there's a car crash you know, all sorts of stuff would happen I remember thinking I remember, go, I remember going down the road I had the kids in the back of the car and this cyclist got hit by a car and I thought and I had a Reg t-shirt on I was like, oh my god I was thinking, like why does that the chance of that happening next to me now 
and I got a reg and I had to get out and go out and treat the fucking cyclist oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ and as soon as I beat the car I'm getting back in the fucking car I'm driving now whatever you know not, I, I just i not bothered by this again no extreme emotions whatsoever or it was really hard to sometimes I I would have to pretend to be enjoying something because I knew if I was doing something in a, in a situation I don't know birthday party or I don't know t- t- playing sport or taking the kids to a trampoline park and that, you know that, uh, as an example I'd have to pretend to be enjoying it to, I'd have to be putting it on to, to pretend I was enjoying it because that's what I was supposed to be doing not that I wasn't enjoying it but there was nothing yeah. there was no feeling nothing at all it's the most bizarre thing it's, it's the most difficult it's a really difficult thing to try and explain as well to someone it's like you explained it as numbness exactly like that exactly like that but permanent numbness permanent numbness and then you said about the pinball in your brain bouncing around my cousin uh, who I, I, I mentioned earlier grew up you know alcoholic um, an alcoholic carer's situation and he he's a poet and he wrote a book his first poetry book about his life and he, he called it House of Bees and he explains the brain his brain like that as, as a house of bees just goes, just mayhem chaos going on like that there's thoughts flying about but it's wild and they're all over the place and sometimes you can grab onto one and try and make it stick for a few seconds and other than that it's just just mindless like chaos all the time and I think when you're like that you just you're going through life like on autopilot you're just doing the thing you're supposed to do because there's no other option but you're thinking nothing about it you're not thinking on the grand scale you're not thinking about looking after yourself properly not thinking about what you should and shouldn't be valuing you're just sort of existing in a weird real weird kind of way mm. it's a very odd one but um, I was afraid to try and change from that uh, years later I think years later it got to a stage where I was able to change it myself but it was a case of opening it up emotionally and, and exposing my, I mentioned earlier about um, like vulnerability like exposing myself emotionally opening myself up to feeling things and, and letting myself enjoy stuff but I, I didn't want to do that because I didn't want I was worried about well there's the, there's the opposite to enjoyment if I unlock the emotions back up and allow myself to feel emotions again then it unlocks me to feeling bad that unlocks me to feeling real bad when someone dies. There was a there was there was um, from 06 on. I remember it was happening in 06 when people were killed or injured who were really close to me, um, and I felt nothing. I felt nothing, nothing at all. Not sad. Not disappointed. He was like. I don't feel anything I knew I should have been and that and that carried on and I almost didn't want to expose myself to that again you know and when I did sort of switch those emotions back on I was able to I'd never I've never been more emotional now than ever like I, now when I know someone's like when you earlier got upset fuck it upsets me because I, I know I can I can I can understand how hard it must have been for you at that time for you to get upset about thinking back then how hard it was and I can resonate with that I can yeah. understand it. it's like I don't I don't like feeling other people felt so bad I want I don't want anyone to feel bad like that especially yeah. people who are decent people but it happens I don't and you know when people die or get killed and then we lose them and that happens in life but I think it happens more so to us now our line of work with just people people around us who are close to they go they disappear from our lives earlier than what they should do I want to grow old with all of the awesome guys around me that I know are awesome dudes that everyone in the world should meet you know people are gone and, and, and aren't here anymore and that really upsets me I think man that person should be telling stories of their life and just being around people because they're such a good person they're a force for good in the world and they aren't here anymore and that kills me mm. you know but I get really upset about it and I, I, I cry more I cry more now I cry now over stuff and get especially over people getting killed or injured or dying not killed you know dying from illnesses or whatever would never happen before and that's that side of the vulnerability that I was afraid of in switching those emotions back on I don't want that but the reality is you have to have it yeah. you can't have the happiness and the you know the uh, 
the um, the amazing like ecstatic feelings without having the opposite end of the spectrum it goes back to the peaks and troughs right you have you have to have both it's about how much you let them affect you like let the let the happiness affect you the real good weather remember that yeah. stuff you know and the, the sad stuff just try and get over it real quick <laughs> it's not as easy as that no though. I um, yeah I was convinced that <clears throat> the part of my brain that regulates emotion was just broke it was just it probably was the um, case that's down to you again neuroendocrinology that's yeah. a hormonal thing part, partly psychiatric thing partly probably was the case but I'm the, I'm the same you know now I'll um, can watch a, a film and start feeling upset <laughs> have fuck? you watched Benjamin Button <laughs> have you watched Benjamin Button uh, probably I watched it ago. once mate I'm never watching it again it destroyed me <laughs> I remember my ex-wife I was watching it with at the time my wife at the time I watched Benjamin Button and I'd flicked that emotion my emotional switches back on right yeah and I uh, got to the end and I was I was in floods of tears <laughs> I mean I was blooming mate and it, I there was something about the end scene where spoiler alert where she he is now a little baby uh, you know an old man a, a young boy little baby yeah. he's gone backwards isn't he and she who, they were lovers and she's cradling him <laughs> you don't have to talk about it no <laughs> <laughs> and she's cradling him and I it just killed me and I was just blooming right and my, ex, my wife at the time she's just starts laughing at me she's like Jesus Christ <laughs> you need to get a grip of yourself I can't and help I was like, and she went off to bed and I was like fuck my I, got, I composed myself so okay <laughs> and then I, I went up went upstairs to bed walk in and she and I, I literally I e-purged it from my mind walked in and she looked at me she went have you got a grip of yourself now and that reminded me of the end scene and I started crying again mate <laughs> <laughs> I was in clear. I'll never watch that film ever again. Honest to God, oh, that sounds horrendous. My God, it was horrific, mate. It was horrific. So sad. But but, um, but then yeah. I think that's yeah, you know, that's empathy, right? That's, that's, what, empathy. that's what I was going to say. It's not a bad thing because it shows that you you, you have empathy and you can you know you can empathise with people's positions, even though if it is a fictional <laughs> maybe character. Oh, it was real to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my yeah. God, my God. Do you how, do you see yourself staying in the fire service? Is that full career for you now? Uh, yeah, I love it. It is. I would recommend it to any ex, uh, anyone come from the military, not just the military, but um, there are so many similarities to being in the military. So you work in a close knit team. Um, you know, with, there's um, we have a laugh with each other. Um, you get to experience and see unordinary things um, you know with each other there's the constant training and developing yourself because it's because it's fire and rescue there's all sorts of weird and wonderful incidents um, from RTCs um, what's the strangest one you've done? oh uh, we go to bariatric rescues so Bariatric for someone that is, um, you know, clinically more than obese, right? Um, and you know, they can't get downstairs, or they need to go to a hospital appointment. We've got the, you know, the, the, the equipment to go to a lot of um, bariatric. Bariatric. I've never heard that word yeah. before. There's a I forget the criteria. There's a certain BMI. Or weightage. I don't. I don't quote me on it. I am gonna look it up. Um, Bariatric. Go on. Yeah. What else? Uh, yeah. I mean, we we go to concerns for welfare with the police and the ambulance. So we will gain entry for it could be any number of reasons. Um, as well as your, you know, your flat fires, um, stuff in the community. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of. Uh, work that goes into prevention now as well but it's brilliant you do the, what's what, what's good about it is that <clears throat> I mean the public sector ultimately but the work home life balance is brilliant because you do two long days two nights and then you have four days off ah. so it's brilliant mm. it's just you know you get to do PT they've got gyms you eat together and 
when you turn out on a job, it doesn't feel like work. It's you know, there's a there's an excitement element to it. Do you see unusual things and ordinary things? BMI for bariatric is um, yeah. thirty. Thirty. Mm. Yeah, thirty. That seems at quite least low. thirty. I don't, I don't. Let's have a look at the index. That was that. It mean? Feels low. Let's have a look at the thing. Is it? Right, but thirty would be so. Uh, thirty BMI. Where the fuck is the BMI? I'm just looking at the. Uh, sorry, sorry, folks. Who's waiting for me to body mass <laughs> index? Okay, height. I oh, it's the class one obesity. It starts at so class one obesity starts at thirty BMI. As an example, so what height are you? Inches? Five ten. Uh, yeah, five. Oh god, what's that in inches? Five times twelve. Oh, sixty sixty 60 inches. Five ten, yeah? Five ten. Seventy yeah. In, five, seventy inches. Inches, is that how you measure? Oh uh, it's on this chart. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> so that would be you would have to be two hundred and nine pounds. What's that in kilo? That's not a lot. No. What's that? See, the BMI index is bullshit. That can't be. Well, uh, is there not a what weightage? height here? Five ten. Oh yeah, five ten. Um, well, that, that, okay, that's quite heavy actually. So I'm I'm not I'm about one hundred and ninety pounds I think, and I'm six foot one. Yeah, if you were two hundred nine pounds, you'd be a. What's two hundred nine in kilos? Two hundred nine. I need to find a British one. Yeah. Ninety. No. BMI on index, index, kilos and centimeters. Here you go. Two point two pounds to a kilo, isn't there? Yeah. Right. You're five foot ten. Yeah. Yeah, BMI index of 30, 220 pounds. Fuck off. <laughs> Fucking hell. And the 2.2 2 pound, hang on a minute, 220 pounds. 220, 220 pounds in kilos. So look. 99 kilograms. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a unit. That is a unit. Yeah. I'm 90 kilos and I am six foot one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I safe to say you are you, not bariatric. You wouldn't even need to, you know, just looking at somebody and 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 you know, a lot of the time it's not just down to lifestyle issues. It'll be um they may have had a horrendous accident and have spinal problems or what whatever, um diabetes. So yeah, bariatric rescues. Um, well, ring, ring removals in all kinds of weird and wonderful places. Ring removals, ring removals, ring removal. So, um, as in yeah, jewelry yeah. ring. Yeah. Yeah. So a, t- a typical, a common one that we might be might get would be um, um, somebody suffering with dementia, an elderly person in a care home, and they've had the ring on for fifty years, and the the, the skin is almost growing around oh, wow. the you know the finger. And it's become cut and infected, um, and we would remove it in. We would do it there and then. If if it was bad, it, we would do it in a clinical environment in hospital. Yeah, I thought hospital would do it. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. But they they just call us. Um, yeah, they will just call us to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but we've had um, rings in penises. People that have had to have them off. What? A finger jewelry ring. No, on no. a penis. Um, no, uh, a piercing. Oh yeah, yeah, piercing. Yeah, it's not something I've had to do, but we do get them. Why? Why can't they just take it out themselves? Uh, it'll be infection or oh, inflammation oh, or yeah. God, no, but not. I mean, they're not. You know, they're not. It's not like get a, go to one of them every shift. Um, so it's good. It's good. It's really good. It's really interesting. Um, some of the the, the communities in, in Manchester as well. The they're interested in a good variety of jobs, water jobs, suicides, um, you know, hangings. If someone's hanging, we'll go and take them down. Um, as well as your, you know, your house fires and your bread and butter kind of stuff. But it's it's, it's really it's really rewarding, and I'd recommend it to any you know, ex-military is perfect for it. The discipline's already there. Phys- physically fit. What I what I craved doing the freelance consultancy stuff was routine. You know, I'm a creature of habit. I like to know what I'm doing. I like to know what my shifts are, um, and it's brilliant for that because you know what when you're off years in advance. Uh, you know, I can just look at the rotor for the next two years and see what what am I doing. 
Christmas in 2026. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, Shit, know. I've not got an excuse for the in-laws at Christmas. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Need to change jobs. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good. It is really good. Really enjoyable. Oh, I'm good, very mate. fortunate. Yeah. Good, mate. Well, it's been a pleasure, dude. Uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to cover? Uh, I don't think so. Um, all of the book stuff is on my social media, um, Beyond the Drop Zone. Can, is there a pre-order yet? Uh, no, the okay. pre-order will be out mid-September. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's all on, mo- mostly Instagram is what I use. you got a website now? No. no. Right, so I'll, no. I'll put your Instagram link um, on the blurb for this. Yeah, there's an Instagram page, there's a Facebook page. Um, yeah, I'm just putting it on all because I'm, I'm like I said, because I'm doing it independently. I'm kind of learning a lot of stuff as I go along with advice from people, but it's you know it's fine, it's good. It's um, you can audio book it. I'd like to. I don't Do it. quite know how to go about doing it. Easy, <laughs> it, uh, easy. One, you need to record the fucking audio book v- v- voice, and two. You upload it to, um, you just submit it to uh, a website called ACX. ACX is partnered with Amazon. I've just done it for someone else. Right. ACX is partnered with Amazon. And you just put it on there. It has to meet certain quality criteria. Honestly, it's dead simple. I've just done it for an, uh, uh, an elderly lady who recorded her book um, and didn't have a clue how to get it onto Audible. All done. Right. And there was no cost to it. It works the same way as your self-publishing. So you, you upload it and you just get a share of the royalties from when they sold. Yeah. Dead simple, mate. Oh, Get a shout if you want any advice on that. It's really simple. Yeah, cheers. Um, and uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find somewhere up there to record it. Yeah. yeah. Because I assume you want to do it yourself. Up in the north. Yeah. 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 Plenty of spaces. But no, yeah, mate, cheers. it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for joining down. Yeah, good journey thank for you. you. And um, good luck with the book launch. And uh, again, thanks for sharing your story, dude. It's been, uh, been, been great, to, uh, great to listen to it.